I'm Pastor Ron Elliott. Let me begin by saying a huge thank you to all of those in the medical field, all of those that are civil servants, and the first responders that are still working away in our communities to protect and to aid us in this time of great need. To all those essential workers still on the job, Lone Star is praying for you. To our president, Donald Trump, and his fearless leadership, a big thank you for your direction. You are daily in our prayers. To our governor, Andy Bashir, and our local mayor, Kevin Cotton, thank you so much for your relentless dedication to our state and our community. We are committed to lifting you also up in our prayers. We must remember that these are trying times for everyone involved. Emotions run high, feelings supplant common sense, anger runs over, chaos springs roots, divisions arise, and fear grips the heart of man. In these times, I challenge our church to be steadfast in prayer and the Word of God, especially through these next few weeks and we're figuring out exactly where we're gonna be at the end of this thing. I refuse to dwell on the negative of this predicament, but choose to see the silver lining and the extreme fortune afforded the church in these rare moments of history. As for Lone Star, it is a prime opportunity to be the church God has called us to be. In our intro, you were given a walkthrough of the building Although the parking lot is empty and the pews are presently void of souls, I want you to know that God is everywhere. I pray God will minister to you today in the confines and the comforts of your homes. I trust you've joined us. I pray God will minister to you today in the confines and comforts of your home. I trust you've joined with me in prayer for this world in which we live. Our prayer is for a, a healing for this land, but also for a mighty revival. This very well could be the tipping point or the turning point that catapults the church back to her proper place in the world. I simply ask for the church to be the church. Let the body do the work that it was called to do, so fulfilling the purpose and the mission of our head, the Lord Jesus Christ. It's imperative at this particular moment in history that we pause and reprioritize. Let's seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Let all of these things be added unto us. Now, last week we began our, our first Sunday morning service on Facebook Live, speaking from the subject, When Fear Gives Way to Faith. We talked about Noah and the faith factor that was driven by the fear of the Lord. We referenced Proverbs chapter number one, verse number seven. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Let's transition to a different angle. To view when fear gives way to faith. Fear, as we have previously mentioned, is not defined in scripture by its worldly view as much as it is by its godly view. The word fear throughout scripture is one simple word that must be viewed through the product of its use. In other words, what is the fear you possess producing? We talk more about this in a moment, but as for now, faith is not defined by the object of your view, for faith is blind. But it is defined by the position of your trust because Proverbs 3 says, Lean not on your own understanding, but in all your ways acknowledge. Would you say that with me? Acknowledge him and he shall direct your path. The word acknowledge is an Old Testament word for praise. It's just simply yada. When you praise him, you draw attention to his handiwork and his blessings. So let me, let me state here that whatever comes our way, whether good or bad, I, I willfully choose to praise him with the entirety of my life. I will purpose to declare 
his works in my life because I want, I need, I covet, and I desire the hand of God directing and ordering my steps. Now, it is impossible to fear the Lord without an element of faith in him. However, it takes no faith in God at all to fear the world in which we now live. The element of faith is obsolete and even voided when the product of your life is a constant state of fear that is fueled by your surroundings. There's no better time to see a worldly view of fear than what we see right now. If the world has ever needed faith, it is today. But let me take it one step farther. The world needs fear too. Not the fear of sickness or disease or, or even financial collapse or job security or death, but a fear of the Lord. Oh God, let it be returned to the hearts of the people of this world. Could it be that God is using a cautionary and discretionary moment in time like this to, to shift our eyes off this chaotic world and to fix them on a peace that passeth all understanding. God can use the darkest of moments and the darkest of times to reveal the greatest of light. Matter of fact, in John we would read that the light shineth in darkness and the darkness comprehended it not. In other words, the darkness couldn't put out the light that come from him. The smallest of light can light up the darkest of rooms. He will use the greatest of laws to reveal the comfort that only he can give like none other. He will, he will use the most dreaded of situations to reveal a way of escape. Matter of fact, he will take those moments in our life that we don't know how to deal with. And he'll find a way to turn it out for our good. Because the God that we serve is working all things out for our good. Joseph. Let's talk about Joseph. Let's talk about the life of Joseph. How that he went through many perilous times in his life. He went from a pit all the way to a palace. But from the pit to the palace there were so many ups and downs in his life. It seemed as though he lived the life of a roller coaster constantly up and down, thinking in one moment his, his life would be taken and another handed to him. At moments he was in the pit of despair and other moments he was in a prison of holding, all preparing him for that moment in the palace. When we look at Joseph, those very men that come against him, those very brothers that took advantage of him. When assembled before him, he simply looked at them and said, you meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. We've got to understand today in this world in which we live, there is evil and wickedness, and perversion on every side. You can't go very far outside the confines of your home without seeing it. But in the midst of this wicked, evil, perverse world that we live, God can even use those things to bring revival to the midst of this world. Let's look at what happened shortly after the life of Joseph when we read Exodus chapter number 1, verse number 8. Now, there arose up a new king over Egypt which knew not Joseph. We, we see what happens here. We see the affliction that was laid upon the backs of the people of Israel and how they were oppressed. They were oppressed because of the fear of Pharaoh. The fear of Pharaoh and the Egyptians that the Israelites would either rise up against them or join themselves with other countries to, to upset Egypt. So what did they do? They oppressed them. They suppressed them to the point to where they would put more labor on them and make them subservient. In the midst of this, we see that Israel in captivity would thrive. They would complain, but they would also thrive. 
They would build great cities in Egypt. But Exodus chapter number 2, verse number 23, tells us a different side of the story. And it came to pass in the process of time that the king of Egypt died, and the children of Israel sighed by reason of their bondage, and they cried. And their cry came up unto God by reason of the bondage. It was that bondage that drove them to cry out to God. It was the limitations placed upon them in the world in which they lived at that time that caused their cry to come up before their God. And God heard their, their groaning, and God remembered his covenant with Abraham, with Isaac, and with Jacob. And God looked on the children of Israel, and God had respect unto them. He heard their cry. He remembered his covenant. And he looked on the children of Israel and had respect to them. If ever there is a time for the church to cry out to God, this is that time. These are those moments that the church must cry out to God. We must intercede for a world that does not know him. These are tough times. These are times that deal with the hearts of men in ways that their hearts would fail them. But we have that peace that passeth all understanding. And when we say a peace that passeth all understanding, we understand it's a peace that doesn't seem to make sense in the world in which we live and the things by which we are surrounded. However, that peace is a deep settledness in our soul. It's a solace for our spirit. It speaks to our heart and speaks to our mind. It comforts us. That peace can only come from God. It's the peace that takes the the worldly fear that we've been talking about, and crushes it in its very grip. Because that peace comes from God, the maker of heaven and earth. And so therefore, we understand keenly today. Assembled in your homes, at the request of our government, still knowing that God's on the throne and he's in control. Jude chapter number 1, verse number 21 would tell us, Keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. And if some have compassion, making a difference, and others save with fear, pulling out of the fire, hating even the garment spotted by the flesh now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy to the only wise God, our Savior, be glory and majesty, dominion and power both now and forever. Amen. Jude. Jude, that, that one that took up pen in hand and his writings were challenging to the church of that day. But as we look at Jude, we understand in the midst of it that there was a joy unspeakable that overwhelmed his soul. And he was telling the church and strengthening the church and edifying the church and encouraging the church, telling them that that joy that he had, you can have too. When you realize that the God that you serve is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory. He's not going to just do it in a way that you're beat down, in a way that you are overcome, in a way that you are depressed, in a way that you are oppressed. But he's going to do it in a way that you enter his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise because of an exceeding joy that arises within you. Joy. Not just simple happiness, but joy. When we look at what Jude had to say, we must understand that some are saved by compassion and some are saved by fear. The God of glory will always get glory. And in this situation that we look at standing before us. That as individuals, 
We cannot overcome by ourselves. We need God. And the world is beginning to understand how much they need God. It's these moments of fear that God grips the heart of men. And through the, the fear of the world begins to pull them closer to the fear of the Lord. This world cannot save them. This world cannot give them life. But I'm looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of my faith today. The one that wants to give us abundant life. That life more abundantly. Ephesians chapter number 2, verse number 8 through 9 would say, For by grace are you saved through faith. And that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. When that fear that we have in the Lord begins to create within our heart a faith in Him, and that faith, that measure of faith that's given to the heart of every man, whether it's little faith or great faith, and we can find both in Scripture, the man with little faith and the man with great faith, that Great faith or that little faith can save us in this time of need, not of works. We can't do anything to deserve it. For by grace are you saved through faith. It's the grace of God. It's the unmerited favor of God. We're going to dig deeper into the word of God in these next few weeks. But as we do so, we must understand just as God heard the cry of Israel coming forth out of Goshen, he can hear the cry of his people coming forth out of their homes. Deliver us from this. Spare us from this. Help us through this. We must remember what David would pen in the 23rd Psalm when he said, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. I won't fear, fear the evil, but I will fear the Lord. Because the fear of evil of this world only creates chaos, but the fear of the Lord brings a peace that passeth all understanding. It's not promised happiness, but it promises you a joy. There's a way in the midst of this to have victory in your soul. That's what happens when fear gives way to faith. God bless you today. We'll join you on Wednesday night again on our Facebook page and our website. We are so honored that you've joined us today. Once again, remember to pray for the leaders of our country, our president, our governor, Andy Bashir, and also our mayor, Kevin Cotton, and all of the leaders of our government. Keep these men in prayer at this time. God bless you.